afternoon, everyone. I'm Forrest Ray, reporter at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Unlocking Insights from Extracellular Vesicles, a Novel Approach to Pancreatic Cancer Detection, and is sponsored by Biological Dynamics. Our speakers are Stuart Ibsen, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Oregon Health and Science University, and Rob Turner, Vice President of Product Development at Biological Dynamics. You may type a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look at the bottom tray of your window, there are a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Stuart Ibsen. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I wanna thank the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be able to share with you today uh, some of the work that we've been doing, uh, being able to recover various uh, extracellular vesicles from undiluted plasma using a technique called dielectrophoresis and the use of these particles for detecting and uh, differentiating pancreatic cancer from benign pancreatic diseases. Uh, my lab here at Oregon Health and Science University is focused on a couple different aspects of early cancer. We're working on this early cancer detection. Uh, as well as being able to develop new therapeutics to be able to treat these early stage cancers um, and therapeutics that are more appropriate for this early stage of cancer when it's really small, hasn't had a chance to spread. So these are things that would allow us to be able to localize activity uh, through the development of light activatable prodrugs and pro drugs of immunotherapy compounds, light activatable antibodies. Uh, but today on the dielectrophoresis technology, and uh, just to start off with the, um, let's see here, it's not, there we go. Just to start off with, I wanna uh, say that I have no financial disclosures uh, to make. And it turns out that there are uh, a variety of different kinds of nanoparticles that are being released by the tumor uh, throughout all stages of, of its development. Uh, here we can see that there are a couple of different mechanisms that these particles are released through. Uh, one of them is through active secretion. So these are particles being actively secreted by the tumor uh, as part of a communication system to be able to prepare tissues for downstream, um, uh, downstream tissues for later invasion and also through suppression of the immune system. These extracellular vesicles include exosomes and are basically physical pieces of the cell membrane that are being released in a little nanoparticle closed uh, circular kind of spherical particle form. And they carry with them very important biomarkers that are on the surface of the cancer cells themselves. So these are, are literally little pieces of the tumor that are in circulation. The other mechanism that we're interested in is through uh, necrosis. So this is in uh, regions of the tumor that are hypoxic. They are undergoing necrotic cell death, where the cells are actually just sort of uh, lysing open and releasing their contents into circulation. And that includes uh, pieces of cellular organelles and pieces of the genomic material, including large chunks of DNA. Now, these all have really important biomarkers that can be used for detecting cancer, but there is a real challenge in being able to recover these particles from plasma to be able to do that type of analysis. And this difficulty in recovering particles is really the main uh, challenge in being able to bring particle-based diagnostics to the clinical uh, laboratory environment, where we can actually use it to be able to scan large populations of patients uh, for the presence of cancer. So to be able to address this challenge, um, we have uh, worked with biological dynamics and we purchase these little micro electrode uh, chip devices from, uh, from this company. Um, they can have over a thousand micro electrodes on something about the size of a penny. So these are really very small electrode arrays that are being produced. The electrode arrays are at the bottom of a microfluidic channel. And you can see that here uh, in this sort of 
small cross-sectional view of the chip itself. We can load our plasma sample onto the chip, and our plasma sample has all those nanoparticles that we're interested in recovering. We apply an alternating electric field to that electrode array, it creates an electric um, field gradient that resonates with the particles that we're interested in collecting and preferentially creates a force on them, a dielectrophoretic force that pulls those particles down to the electrode edge and will hold them there with enough force that we can introduce a wash that removes the bulk plasma, thereby purifying these particles and having them concentrated around the electrode edge allows us to bring in various immunostains to be able to look for biomarkers that are carried by those particles. So this entire process is all conducted on a single chip. So this is collection and detection, which is really great to be able to combine multiple steps of this uh, particle and analysis process into a single device. So there are several unique benefits that DEP or this dielectrophoresis technique uh, has. Uh, because we're using a microfluidic chip, we don't have to use a whole lot of plasma to be able to fill it, just 30 microliters of plasma. And um, it is truly a multi-omic approach that allows us to be able to look at different types of biomarkers on different types of nanoparticles all simultaneously. So the types of nanoparticles being collected, and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail, uh, contain DNA, RNA, and protein. And those are the three major biomarker classes that we're really interested in. What's nice about this is that it can be run in uh, undiluted plasma, so we don't have to have any kind of sample manipulation, which really makes this a lot easier for clinical translation. The less steps, the easier it is for uh, people to run this. And it only really takes two hours for us to be able to recover the particles and then do the biomarker quantification all on the chip itself. Now, the breakthrough innovation um, that biological dynamics was able to introduce to these chips was the addition of a porous hydrogel layer over the surface of the electrodes. So here we're looking at the electrode in cross-section. The electrodes are platinum. And when you have metal that comes into contact directly with a very salty liquid like plasma or blood, uh, typically you'll get instant electrolysis. So you'll get all these electrochemistry things happening. You'll get the production of free radicals that can destroy your sample. And you also get the production of bubbles of oxygen and hydrogen that will kind of ruin your sample if you get too many of too many bubbles. But the addition of this hydrogel layer creates a physical barrier between the platinum and the plasma sample above. And that suppresses a lot of this electrochemistry. So we can actually run dielectrophoresis and we can collect particles in undiluted plasma, which is truly unique in the electro, uh, electrokinetic field, uh, where most of the work has to be in diluted plasma or in uh, special buffers to be able to prevent this kind of electrolysis. So this is really a big advance in the field to be able to work directly with undiluted plasma. Now we've gone through and done a lot of work tracking particles uh, as they're being collected. And here you can see uh, a computer model of the electric field around, or the electric gradient around the electrodes themselves. So the red area shows basically where the dielectrophoresis forces are going to be high in what we call positive, dielect or positive dielectrophoresis. Uh, and the blue areas, the dark blue areas here, are regions where there's going to be a low field gradient. So what we did was we were able to theoretically calculate where the particles should, should travel as they're being collected. And that's these thick red lines here where the particles ought to move. And then these dotted lines around it are showing the actual trajectories of where the particles actually went. And this is really uh, sort of amazing for us to be able to see because you can see in this region here, there's a local minima of the electric field. So there's uh, a low region where we would expect particles to sort of uh, migrate towards and then get, get trapped. And then there's a global minima here at these really dark regions uh, in between the electrodes. 
And so one of the things that was really amazing was seeing these particles actually move along these lines here and make this sharp right-hand turn um, as we would expect because they're going from a global minima to a, um, a local minima and then to these like high regions. And they can go in the opposite direction as well in negative DEP. Uh, so this really helped to explain some of the phenomenon that we're seeing on the chip and look at the relative contribution from different forces. So there are thermally driven uh, fluid flow. There's another type of fluid flow called electroosmosis, uh, all moving particles around. But in this particular case, the dominant force here is dielectrophoresis in being able to collect these particles. Now, we've also uh, worked with biological dynamics to understand some of the interactions that that hydrogel layer has with the platinum electrodes. And one of the interesting things that we've discovered is that the hydrogel actually will lift off of the platinum electrodes. So here we see the electrodes in cross-section, um, with the platinum being shown in gray here. And as we apply the electric field uh, to begin collecting particles from plasma, we see that there's a dome that begins to form, and the particles seem to, to attract to the, the electrodes better when a dome is actually formed there. So we, we did some computer simulations to understand how this works a little bit better. First, we actually looked at the uh, actual domes themselves. So these are scanning electron microscopy images of the electrodes, SEM images, where we actually were collecting particles from human plasma. And then we freeze dried the chip. And then we're able to lyophilize it um, to get rid of the water and then take a look at the actual electrodes under SEM. And we can see all these, these sort of crinkles here on the surface, which we believe are left over from the dome forming. And then when we freeze dried it, the, the dome collapsed, but it left behind these creases showing that there had been earlier inflation of the hydrogel around that area. And then down here, we have computer simulations uh, showing what the consequence of having these domes are. Here we have a no dome situation uh, as opposed to one where the dome is present on the right. Uh, here you can see the edge of the dome that we're modeling in this particular um, console model. And the red region is and basically the gradation from red to this darker orange color is a lot less of a gradient than what we see here with this red region, which is a little bit larger, out to this uh, yellow region of electric field intensity. So this shows us that we are getting a much higher field gradient generated because of the presence of the dome, as opposed to when there is no dome present. And that can explain why we see better collection of particles in the presence of um, this dome formation. So it's a really great aspect uh, to be able to increase the amount of particles that are being collected. Now, we've used this technology to collect a variety of different particles. Um, here we're showing collection of bacteria from an artificial saliva sample. So these bacteria have been genetically engineered to be lactate sensors. They will produce green fluorescent protein in the presence of lactate, which is uh, a molecule that's over secreted by cancers in the oral cavity. And so the idea is that you could use these, um, these bacteria that would be present in like yogurts and things like that. You can have a mouthwash with them and you have it in your mouth. And if there's a, a oral cancer that's producing a lot of lactate, these bacteria will turn green, fluorescent green. And then we are able to show that we can recover these bacteria from saliva uh, using the dielectrophoresis technique. And we can see here the collection of those bacteria around the electrode edge, uh, where that field strength is the highest. And we can see that with increasing amounts of lactate, we get higher and higher levels of fluorescence. So this is a really versatile technique, this, um, these chips to be able to collect a variety of particles from a variety of different body fluids. We also use this uh, technique to be able to recover artificially made uh, drug delivery nanoparticles. So these are particles that are designed to contain chemotherapy drugs. And then we can 
uh, recover them from blood to be able to look at how being in the blood basically changes their their structure and their surface coatings. Uh, but we found that dielectrophoresis, these chips did a really great job of collecting empty liposomes and filled liposomes, uh, which was really exciting because these particles mimic in a lot of ways the extracellular vesicles that are being released by tumor. Uh, and what we see here in these pictures are uh, the overall fluorescence level uh, before dielectrophoresis is added. After seven minutes of collection, we see really good accumulation of particles around the electrode edge. They're held there through that wash uh, to be able to purify them. And then we can actually recover them off the chip for off-chip analysis, if, analysis if necessary. So this got us thinking, could we actually use this technique to be able to recover exosomes and other kinds of nanoparticles uh, from plasma? And so that's exactly what we were able to do. So we were able to get a glioblastoma, a brain cancer cell line, uh, and we collected the exosomes that were produced by those, those cells, and we labeled them red so that we can follow them through this entire collection process. Uh, we spiked those exosomes into a human plasma sample and then put them on the chip here. And you can see we're looking down at the surface of the chip. Each circle is an electrode in the array. And when we look at things under fluorescence, we actually see that the particles are really well distributed throughout the entire uh, sample. So with 10 minutes of applying that alternating field to the electrode array, we see really good accumulation of the particles around the uh, edge of the electrode, good accumulation. And then we do a 10 minute wash and purify these particles. So this is really exciting because the traditional method of being able to recover exosomes and other extracellular vesicles from plasma is an overnight ultracentrifugation. So that's like 16 hours of an ultracentrifuge uh, use. And that's very difficult to be able to scale up for a clinical laboratory environment. Uh, another way that people traditionally get exosomes out is through a filtration techniques. Uh, but that's, can, that can require a lot of starting material and is also very labor intensive. So this technique is really quite remarkable in being able to collect these particles in such a short period of time. Now we get two added benefits from this as well. Uh, the first is that we get a concentration of the particles around the electrode edge. So we get a better signal to noise ratio. And then the second thing that's really good about this is that we know where they're located. So we can come in with our various stains looking for biomarkers uh, and we'll know where to look on the surface of the electrodes because we know exactly where the particles are located. And so we were able to do that here with uh, a stain for RNA. So about a third of the particles that were collected had stainable RNA content. Uh, and we were able to recover these particles off the chip and then analyze the RNA, and we could find uh, cancer-related mutations that we knew were in the glioblastoma cell line. So this is really exciting to be able to see actual cancer mutations in the RNA that's been collected by uh, this dielectrophoresis technique. And then you can see that we can recover most of that material off the surface of the chip. Now, we were able to actually look at the particles themselves as they were collected. Uh, we've got here um, those same glioblastoma exosomes that were put into a buffer so we could see them very easily and then collected on the chip. We freeze dried the chip and then snapped it in half so that we could look at them uh, in a zoomed in fashion. Uh, you can see here the electrode itself um, on the, in sort of an angled view on the SEM. Uh, and then when we zoom in, we actually see the particles themselves captured along the edge of the electrode, which is, which is right here. And this is really exciting because usually exosomes are imaged using transmission electron microscopy techniques that dry them out and they kind of flatten out into a donut shape. But this freeze drying technique preserves a lot of their original morphology. So we can see that they're not perfect spheres. They have their own texture. They have their own shapes to them. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done understanding this as well. Uh, but this is something that really shows these particles are being collected right there along the electrode edge, just like we see in the fluorescence images. Now, we've been able to characterize the nanoparticles that were collected. We can 
recover them off the chip using various techniques. And we find that the peak of the size distribution is uh, 95 nanometers, with 90% of the particles being from 65 to uh, 359 nanometers. And we can adjust this size distribution based on the frequency that we apply to the chip. So by changing the frequency that's applied of the electric field, we can change where the peak of that uh, size distribution is located. But for us to be able to go for exosomes and other extracellular vesicles, this uh, 95 nanometer peak is, is really ideal. So we've been able to tune this really well to be able to go after the particles that we're interested in. Now, one of the things that we've developed is a cyclic immunofluorescence technique to be able to look at multiple biomarkers on the uh, collected particles. So what we have here is a series of different stains that have been put onto the chip. We have a um, DAPI channel in blue showing the collection of polystyrene beads. So this is our internal control. We're showing that the that there's always some sort of um, particles being collected. Uh, and then we have two fluorescence channels, one in green and one in red, uh, that allows us to look at two different biomarkers simultaneously on these collected particles. Uh, so this first row here, we can see that uh, dielectrophoresis has collected particles from the human plasma sample. We come in with our first round of staining to look for CD9 and uh, FASTEN. Uh, we see that we get good signals from both of those. And then we go through a quenching step that basically kills the fluorescence, but allows, but is done in such a way as to preserve the biomarkers for another round of, of staining. So we can come in with a second round of staining for uh, these different biomarkers here, and we can see that we get staining of them again, even after the first round had been bleached. And that allows us to quench these again and then we can come in with a third round of biomarkers and to see that, that uh, these particular exosomes are positive for uh, Claudin-3. So this is a really powerful technique that allows us to be able to look at multiple biomarkers in the same sample on the same chip uh, without having to recollect another set of exosomes from the same patient. And to be able to quantify all of the different things that we're seeing, we actually have developed some optical quantification software that will go through. So here you see a wide field view of the electrode array. So each of these little dots here is one of the electrodes. Uh, and the little wavy lines in between are the, the basically the electrical connections between them. We have a program that will go through and look and find each of these circles and then map that location to the fluorescence images uh, shown here and segment each of these electrodes. And then we look at the fluorescence inside of this designated area that covers the ring around the electrode edge and compare it to the fluorescence uh, in the background area uh, outside of this region. And that allows us to be able to create a histogram of the uh, fluorescence intensities around the electrode edge where we expect sample to be located, and then be able to subtract that from any background signal that might be present, uh, allowing us to be able to define the background level here shown by this black plane that gives us true signal that allows us to make really fine uh, uh, and very precise measurements of the fluorescence intensity, which corresponds to how much expression there is of that particular biomarker. Uh, the program also goes through and will automatically look for various um, artifacts within the image and eliminate those electrodes automatically so that we don't have to worry about that interfering with our background. And this technique is easily adaptable to uh, different geometries, so it can be used in a bunch of different microfluidic environments that are looking at fluorescence intensities. So we were able to use this technique also to look at a bunch of different types of nanoparticles uh, from plasma. So here we see the collection and successful staining of a bunch of different organelle fragments that are being released, we think, we hypothesize, from the necrotic regions of the tumor. And this includes uh, pieces of mitochondria, uh, centrosomes, uh, and pieces of the endoplasmic reticulum. 
And also we can find that there are these nanoparticles of DNA that are in circulation. So there's a lot of the cell-free or CF DNA that's in, in circulation released through a variety of different mechanisms. Uh, and some of that can be collected on the dielectrophoresis chip uh, and stains successfully with cyber gold here, uh, as well as some associated histone proteins. So this is really exciting because we're looking at a variety of different particles, all collected simultaneously from the human plasma, uh, giving us uh, an increased number of biomarkers that we can be looking for. So of particular interest are the CFDNA nanoparticles. So we were able to look at the size distribution of these DNA nanoparticles uh, and found that they have a peak diameter around 105 nanometers. So right in the area that we would expect uh, based on how particles are being collected. Uh, but what was really surprising to us was the, the distribution of the fragment links. So it turns out that the dielectrophoresis, the nanoparticles being collected on these chips, is enriching for a different or a special subset of overall circulating CFDNA. And that's shown here in these graphs. So using traditional kyogen kits that are designed to recover uh, DNA that is derived through an apoptotic mechanism. Apoptosis is the natural cell death. It happens a lot in the body. In healthy cells, it's a natural, normal process within the body. And it produces DNA fragments that are about 180 base pairs in length, uh, which you can see here really well in these orange graphs. There is also a secondary peak here around 360 base pairs in length that corresponds to uh, a second histone. So the reason that you get 180 base pairs here is because the cell is chopping the DNA right at the histone protein. So the DNA wraps around the histone, it chops it at the, at the protein, giving you this uh, nice 180 base pairs. And if it chops it every two histones, then you get this 360. So this is a controlled cell death. It's a controlled way of being able to cleave up the DNA uh, for processing. But what we're finding with dielectrophoresis is that we're collecting uh, not, not really a whole lot of this 180 base pair apoptotic DNA, but a much more enrichment for these larger base pair fragment links. For this is that the DNA coming from the necrotic regions of the tumor is not undergoing this nice and orderly apoptotic degradation. It's a much more chaotic and random breaking of the DNA the cells are lysing open and releasing large chunks of genomic material that go into circulation. They're cleaved through um, fluidic shearing as well as random nuclease activity. And that's what's giving us this broader, less ordered um, distribution of fragment links. So this is really exciting because we're really interested to understand better how this DNA, uh, what kind of biomarkers this DNA might be carrying uh, and if it's enriched for fragments that come from the tumor itself. So to be able to explore this further, we looked or we developed a custom thermal cycling system uh, that can actually thermally cycle the DEP chip itself so that uh, we can actually look at the DNA, we can amplify the DNA on the chip directly. And this is really powerful because this avoids the loss of DNA uh, on the chip, and we can amplify it directly on the chip to give us the maximum signal. And we can see that here with this uh, initial work looking at the fluorescence increase with each thermal cycle uh, on the chip itself using uh, a qPCR type uh, technique or quantitative PCR type technique. So this shows that we are amplifying DNA on the chip itself, which is really exciting. And then we were able to recover this DNA and put it through a digital um, digital droplet PCR analysis. So this takes each fragment of DNA that was recovered off the chip and puts it into an individual droplet. And we can tell whether or not there are KRAS mutations in that fragment. So KRAS is something that's very uh, commonly mutated in pancreatic cancer patients. And so we can see here in this uh, graph showing the uh, results of that digital droplet DDPCR analysis, that we were indeed able to find successful, uh, successfully find KRAS mutations in pancreatic cancer patients. And that's shown here by these blue dots. 
The green dots over here show wild type KRAS that was collected as expected. And then these gray dots here show uh, fragments that did not have any uh, KRAS sequences in those droplets. So the ability to be able to detect KRAS mutations in this amplified DNA is really exciting and can help us to add this as an additional biomarker to expanding panels that we're developing uh, to be able to successfully detect pancreatic cancer. So because we're able to collect a variety of different particles, we look, we're also looking at the proteins carried by exosomes and other extracellular vesicles. Uh, and so here we have a pancreatic cancer patient and a colon cancer patient. Both of them are successfully staining for CD63, <clears throat> which shows that there is uh, exosomes being collected in both cases. But only the pancreatic cancer patient is really staining for glycan one uh, which is a potential biomarker, uh, valuable biomarker for pancreatic cancer. So when we look at a larger population of pancreatic cancer patients, uh, here shown in these red dots, we see that there is a significantly higher level of glycan one expression compared to the normal controls um, that are, are, are healthy individuals. The, the challenge with this using just one biomarker is being able to differentiate pancreatic cancer from benign pancreatic diseases, such as pancreatitis and precancerous IPMNs or various lesion, um, benign cysts that can be in the pancreas. Uh, these are all causing a lot of inflammation and that causes them to not be able to be separated from pancreatic cancer. So to be able to address this, this particular challenge, we're actually looking at combining different types of nanoparticles together uh, to make a truly multi-omic biomarker panel. And so that's exactly what we were able to do here. So we, looking, we looked at glycan one and the level of CFDNA uh, simultaneously in each patient. We applied this to a blinded study where we didn't know who had cancer and who was healthy or who had benign pancreatic diseases. Uh, and in this pilot study, we had 39 patients that were distributed through uh, those that had benign cysts, um, those that had precancerous IPMN lesions, and then those that had inflammation from pancreatitis, uh, and compared those to those that had pancreatic cancer. And you can see here that there's a general increase in the expression levels as we go from benign to pancreatic cancer. And this allows us to be able to look at the entire data set in a bivariate analysis. So I know there's a lot going on in this, this graph here, uh, but what we basically have is the glycan one levels being uh, graphed on the x-axis here, the CFDNA levels on the y-axis, and that allows us to actually be able to create a separation between those individuals that have cancer and those that have benign pancreatic diseases. So what we see here in red are the cancer patients and we were able to use uh, a machine learning algorithm, an SVM support vector machine learning algorithm, to define regions where we would expect cancer patients to show up and where we would expect those with benign pancreatic diseases to show up. And that's shown by this line here between the red and the gray regions. Uh, we further subdivided the, the non-cancerous conditions into those where we would believe have low risk for developing pancreatic cancer uh, and those that have higher risk here in this gray region. So a couple of things to point out uh, is that there is a high grade IPMN lesion over here in the cancer region, uh, but that was really exciting because it actually, uh, there's three grades of IPMNs, these precancerous lesions. Uh, it starts off in low grade and it can take 10 years to make it to high grade. But once it reaches high grade, it's actually quite dangerous and will very quickly turn into stage one cancer. So physicians will actually cut them out and do the whole surgery, uh, Whipple surgery, if a high grade IPMN is, is discovered. So having a high grade IPMN out here is actually really beneficial. Uh, this individual out here was, was rather interesting because originally the, this individual was not diagnosed as having pancreatic cancer. They were benign but they had such high levels of the biomarkers that we asked the physicians to do another chart review. And it turns out six months later, this individual was diagnosed with stage two liver cancer. So we were able to see something was wrong with this individual, even though all the traditional scans for 
for cancer were coming up negative. So this is really exciting to be able to see to catch early stage cancers like this. Uh, so most of the, pancre uh, the pancreatitis and the low-grade IPMNs are in this high-risk uh, region, uh, which is good because we can use that to be able to uh, inform physicians that these patients may benefit from closer monitoring over time. Uh, and most of the benign individuals, the benign cysts are out over here, are very low levels of these biomarkers. Uh, there are two stage two cancers here uh, that were just not positive for glycam one but we do have new biomarkers that i'll show you in a minute that are that these two individuals are positive for so this is really exciting because we're able to now separate with these two biomarkers these two biomarkers that are not related to each other in terms of their intensity they're orthogonal to one another uh, we can use these two to be able to separate those with uh, cancer from those with benign pancreatic diseases and this is really exciting because there really isn't any other technique that can look at the low-grade IPMNs and separate them out this well. Uh, so this is, this is really exciting to be able to, to separate them out uh, with such high level of precision like this. And then looking at the overall performance of this biomarker panel, uh, we can see um, this, the ROC curve analysis. So when we combine glycan one and CFDNA together, we get an area under the curve of 0.8. Uh, and this is really remarkable because the standard, the gold standard method for diagnosing uh, pancreatic cancer is these are these ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration tissue biopsies, and they have an, an area under the curve of 0.79. So with just 30 microliters of plasma, we're able to operate at a very similar level to what the, the actual tissue biopsy is able to do. And these tissue biopsies are not trivial. They're very expensive to, um, to run. And about one in 100 patients will develop acute pancreatitis from the pancreas being poked, basically, with an with a aspiration needle. And about one in 10 of those patients will die. So there is um, considerable health risks that are associated with the actual tissue biopsy itself um, that are avoided when we're looking at just a very simple blood draw. So this is very encouraging for us to continue developing this biomarker panel. Uh, and that's what we've done here with two new biomarkers uh, that are showing a significant difference between pancreatic cancer and the healthy controls. And those two individuals I was showing you from before that were glycam one negative were actually positive for these biomarkers. So that means that as we continue to expand our biomarker panel, we're going to do a better job of catching more of these cancer patients and doing a better job of being able to identify who uh, would benefit from additional screening. So these different biomarkers and these different multi-omic types of biomarkers going after DNA, going after proteins, going after RNA, uh, is really going to give us the best picture and capture the most heterogeneity that we can from the, the cancer patient population. Because not all pancreatic cancers are equal. Uh, even though they may be located in the pancreas, they can actually all be quite different from one another. Uh, and then we have a couple of, of exciting things coming down the way. We are looking now at protease activity on the exosomes themselves. And this is the very first time that any electrokinetic device has been used in a dual electrokinetic mode. So, we, we do is we collect the, the exosomes as we do normally, as I've shown you before. Uh, but after they're collected and purified, we can then come in with a peptide that is specially designed to be cleaved by the protease itself, uh, the protease that we're interested in. And when it's cleaved, that creates two charged um, fragments, one of which is positively charged and fluorescently labeled. So we can activate them inside. We can introduce this peptide to the collected particles. And then we can change the chip into an electrophoresis mode, not dielectrophoresis, but electrophoresis mode, and collect these positively charged fragments. Um, and that's exactly what we show here. So here we show the collection of uh, these extracellular vesicles from plasma, as we were demonstrating before. Uh, and then we can introduce our uh, peptide to this uh, sample and then do electrophoresis excuse me, to be able to collect these positive fragments on the negative electrodes. And this is really great because this gives us a signal amplification because we're able to increase the, uh, 
uh, the, because we concentrate these fragments, we can get a signal increase, uh, giving us a better signal as to if there is any protease activity of the specific kinds that we're interested in. When we use a protease inhibitor uh, here, aprotinin, we can actually stop trypsin activity uh, almost entirely, and we see a great reduction in this, in this signal. So we know that the signal that we're seeing here is truly from protease activity. And proteases are really important because in order for the tumor to expand, it has to have protease activity that it's overexpressing. Uh, and this is a, a really powerful biomarker to add to our panel. And then finally, we're able to also show that we can manipulate where a lot of these particles actually go on the chip. So we can see here that we've got protein aggregates in plasma that are uh, collected in positive DEP here. And we can also push them in between the electrodes in negative DEP if we change the conditions uh, to the correct ones here, showing that we're able to manipulate where in the chip we can actually move these particles, uh, which can really help us not only with these particles as biomarkers themselves, but also in the collection of other kinds of biomarkers too. So with that, I uh, just wanted to conclude by saying that dielectrophoresis or, and other electrokinetic techniques on this chip can recover from undiluted plasma, uh, extracellular vesicles, organelle fragments, and CFDNA nanoparticles, all of which contain really valuable biomarkers. Uh, we show that first, uh, this is the first multi-omic biomarker panel that can differentiate pancreatic cancer from benign pancreatic diseases, including importantly from those IPMNs. And uh, we're able to show that the simultaneous recovery of different nanoparticle types uh, is really quick and easy uh, compared to traditional methods. Uh, and these are the kinds of characteristics that are necessary for future clinical point of care applications. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge my team uh, and our funding sources. They've done a really great job uh, working with this technology and being able to apply it to all these different applications. Uh, our OHSU collaborators, including Dr. Rosie Sears and Dr. Brett Shepard uh, and Dr. Terry Morgan, who have been really great in helping us um, uh, interpret our results and working uh, with samples. And then our statisticians, uh, Gian Lim and our uh, uh, machine learning expert, Jubo San, uh, as well as uh, work in the clinical lab with Chris Corliss. I also want to make a special mention of our USC, UCSD collaborator, Dr. Michael Heller, uh, who has been able to uh, do a lot of the initial work developing this technology and the protease inhibitor and the protease uh, substrates. And of course, we're purchasing our chips from Biological Dynamics. And so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Rob Turner. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ibsen. Uh, very exciting work, and uh, you know we, we definitely share the the passion that, that you have around these these chips and the capabilities of this as well. So, thank you for sharing with us today. Um, so, I'm going to take a moment to uh, walk you guys through our, our Exaverita Pro uh, instrument, which is a kind of commercial version of this technology that's coming in the pipeline that we're hoping will kind of empower uh, all of you, anybody here that's on the call today that might be interested in exosomes and really uh, enhance your your work. So, uh, you know, Dr. Ibsen already highlighted quite a few of these things, but to start with the exosomes, right, they really have obviously clear potential, um, but challenges have limited their both research and, and clinical use today. You know, they are a subset of extracellular vesicles, about 30 to 150 nanometers in size, um, and the key is that they carry, right, DNA, RNA, and proteins, so this kind of uh, holy trilogy of molecular biology, if you will. Uh, so there's a lot of interest here in accessing these key biomarkers through exosomes. Um, but the problem is today, getting to them is, is extremely challenging. Uh, as Stuart had mentioned, uh, the, the most common standard today is ultracentrifugation. And unfortunately, there's about as many ultracentrifugation protocols in the world as there are ultracentrifuges. Uh, and so you know, it's a time-consuming process. There's a lot of reproducibility issues. It basically takes a PhD in a lab over a day's worth of time to, to get access to these exosomes. And they're carrying with them a high amount of, of contamination as well. And so I'll be sharing with you all today our, our solution for that, which is our Exaverita Pro system. So how do we do this, right? So uh, this is just, again, zooming out a little bit and, and emphasizing what Dr. Ibsen already highlighted. But we, we leverage what we call ACE, which is alternating current electrokinetics, uh, which is a combination of DEP, AC electrothermal flow, and AC electroosmotic flow. And it sounds complicated, but in practice, it's quite simple. You start with load your sample onto this chip, 
activate this uh, you know, dielectrophoretic electric field gradient, which captures particles of interest onto those electrodes, as you've all seen. And then we introduce a very simple fluid gouache to wash away everything else that's on that chip, leaving behind just this enriched exosome population. And all this is built on a very strong uh, IP foundation. We've got over 50 worldwide patents issued, 20 of which are in the US, and another 30 plus uh, pending worldwide as well. So in what we've done, and again, uh, Dr. Ipsen's work kind of highlighting both, you know, the, some of the size distributions that they saw with exosomes and DNA, we've really tuned this chip over the last decade here at Biodyne to capture particles from about 10 nanometers to 500 nanometers in size. Uh, and so that sweet spot range in the middle includes exosomes, it includes cell-free DNA, um, large protein aggregates, lipoproteins, things like that. Um, but larger particles are, are actively pushed away by the electrodes, and small particles that are below 10 nanometers are too small to be interrogated by the field. And so we can introduce that fluidic gouache and leave behind on the chip just that section there in the middle. And we've really focused our work internally for the most part on cancer. Uh, we have I've done some work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on uh, tuberculosis detection for TB, as well as the uh, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation looking at um, neurodegenerative disease as well. And we've got uh, 19 peer-reviewed publications to date, including some uh, here from Dr. Uh, Dr. Ibsen as well. So the system itself, right, uh, again, uh, this is really our, our kind of first product that we're commercializing. Uh, leveraging this technology. And, and the key here is ease of use and, and performance for isolating exosomes. So as I've already described, you know, ultracentrifugation is a, a very laborious process. It takes more than three hours of hands-on time. So we're really taking that and turning it into something that takes less than five minutes to load. So you load your, your sample and two reagents into a cartridge, load that cartridge into an instrument, hit go on a touch screen, walk away for three and a half hours, and then come back and pull off your exosomes off the cartridge and do whatever you'd like with it downstream. And so we've leveraged this uh, and done some comparisons and performance to see how we stack up against ultracentrifugation. And really the, the key message here is we're getting better yield, better purity and better reproducibility. Uh, so there's some data here that, that kind of shows we're seeing about a two to three X improvement in the actual particle yield when you compare our exosome output in comparison to what you'd get off of a typical UC run. And in addition to that, we're, we're sitting at about a 30X reduction in protein contamination. Uh, this work was primarily working with human plasma, so we're looking at the IgGs, the albumins, and this piece really being able to clean up these small contaminating free-floating proteins in blood uh, is really key, we think, for being able to drive our diagnostic performance when we go take this technology and plug it into an assay downstream. And so just briefly to share an example of that, so we've plugged this chip into our workflow. Again, the first three boxes here show the same sample load into our cartridge on our instrument. You produce an eluate, and then we've taken that eluate and plugged it into a, a Luminex assay, so effectively a multiplex ELISA assay downstream. And then we leverage a, an internally developed machine learning algorithm to quantify a panel of different protein biomarkers. And in the case of pancreatic cancer, which I'm gonna share on the next slide, we're using eight uh, protein biomarkers. And then that ultimately machine learning algorithm is making a call about whether or not that patient has early stage disease. And we just had a publication uh, put out in Nature Communications Medicine Journal, uh, I believe last week, uh, where we took a, so this is just a, a data set that shows our training and validation sets. So our training set included 650 patients, 105 pancreatic cancer and 545 controls. Uh, those controls did, by the way, include some of those gray area samples that uh, Dr. Ibsen was highlighting uh, with chronic pancreatitis and IPMNs. Uh, and, but really the highlight here is we're focusing this testing exclusively on stage one and stage two samples. Uh, and that's something that, you know, for those, I would encourage you to kind of peel back the onion on a lot of folks that are doing uh, early cancer detection work today. And a lot of those data sets include or are heavily enriched with stage three samples. And again, the combination of our chip and really being able to focus this testing on true early stage disease uh, is leading, we think, to better performance. And so we trained with that algorithm, that set, applied it to an independent validation data set with 113 samples, uh, 10 stage one and 20 stage two. Uh, and again, the AUC that we're producing with that assay, our exivita pancreas assay, is about a 0.95. Uh, with 90 plus percent sensitivities and specificities respectively. Um, so again, this is really class leading performance in this space. We're really excited about it. And you know, we really believe that the keys to this are the fact that you know, we have such a quality uh, chip upstream that we can use to isolate these exosomes and really focus the style of diagnostic testing 
uh, on that exosomal specific uh, population. So key takeaways today, again, exosomes have clear potential, um, but there's been challenges that have stood in the way of their use. Our platform technology really gives unprecedented access to these exosomes and disease-associated biomarkers. Our Exaverta Pro system makes that process very easy, as easy as one, two, three. Uh, and again, high-quality sample prep upstream leads to high-quality results downstream. And uh, you know, if you're here and you're on the line, you're working with exosomes, we'd love to hear from you and reach out to us about how we can work with you and, and help empower uh, the work that you're doing with our, our chip and technology as well. So with that, I'll pass to Forrest, who's going to handle some Q&A. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Stuart and Rob. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and give us your feedback. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is, do you see any difference in the biomarkers between the total circulating free tumor? I think to speak, the questioner means like organelle fragments, cell-free cell nucleic acids, et cetera, including exosomes versus exosomes only. I can, I can um, uh, start with that question. So we are not actually separating the exosomes themselves just from the other kinds of nanoparticles that are being collected. Uh, what we're getting is sort of a uniform cross-section of all the nanoparticles that are in circulation uh, at that time. So uh, we then go through and sort things out with the different immuno stains and the different stains that we have after a collection. The real challenge is being able to get those particles out of circulation. So we haven't done a study yet that looks at just the exosomes themselves versus the other types of particles that are in the circulation, but that is a good question. Thank you. Our next question is, what percentage of biomarkers released into circulation are in EVs and therefore available for purifying? Well, that's a really good question. We don't know the answer to that. So there are a bunch of other uh, free-floating proteins and proteases and free-floating small bits of DNA, like those 180 base pairs, uh, that are too small to be picked up by the, this um, ACE or DEP technique. And, but that's OK, because we're really interested in this exosome subfraction. And one of the reasons we're so interested in the exosomes is because they are over-secreted by the tumor uh, in order to be able to uh, survive. The tumors will actually over-secrete these exosomes and these extracellular uh, vesicle nanoparticles in order to really try to suppress the immune system and basically prepare other tissues downstream for later invasion. So these exosomes are a special subset where it, they are being enriched uh, for particles being derived from the tumor itself. What's also really interesting is the, the proteins on the nanoparticles. So the DNA itself is a really great biomarker, but there's only one copy of DNA per cell. So the RNA is an amplified version of the DNA, so we get multiple tens, maybe hundreds of copies of RNA for each um, uh, cancer cell. And then the proteins are amplified yet again from the RNA, so you can get many more proteins from each piece of RNA. So the proteins on the exosomes are really the, the best um, target for us to be going after. Uh, the DNA itself is actually really important, as well as the RNA. Uh, but that's why we've been focusing mostly on the biomarkers carried by the exosomes. That's because those exosomes are being over-secreted by the tumor. Thank you. Our next question is, was the applied AC voltage magnitude the same for different frequencies? Um, so when we're going up in frequency, we can change the, the actual amplitude. So we typically run at um, 10 volts peak to peak with at about 14 kilohertz uh, for most of our exosome collection. Uh, but to be able to push the, the particles uh, in between the electrodes in negative DEP, we had to drop the, the frequency into the, the hertz range there. 
Uh, so it kind of depends. You get different electrochemistries and you get different effects at different frequencies of applied electric field, uh, AC field. So we have to adjust the intensity to be able of the field to be able to match those, to be able to account for those differences. So it's something that we have to work out empirically as we move through the different frequency ranges. Just to add a little bit of color for that as well. So we are typically balancing with electrolysis with this technology. And as, as Stuart kind of mentioned, as you drop down in frequency, you typically have to reduce your voltage because you're getting closer and closer to a DC signal, which can drive uh, you know, electrolysis, basically splitting water into gas and causing bubbles on the surface of the chip. But as you drive that frequency up, you have more freedom to, to walk your uh, voltage amplitude up as well. Yeah, I agree. It's always sort of this. Uh, you know, combination watching out for bubbling on the chip and then dialing back your intensity to be able to prevent that bubbling. Right, thank you. And uh, can this technology differentiate surface associated DNA and RNA versus the internalized nucleic acid on the exosomes? So yes, it can actually. So what we can do is we look at uh, membrane permeant and membrane impermeant DNA stains. So we can use um, like different stains like uh, uh, cyber gold and yo-yo to be able to tell if something's on the surface at least or if it's on the inside. And so we actually see, um, so when we use the cell impermeant membrane stain or uh, DNA stains, uh, the, the stains that can't go inside of a particle we do see successful DNA staining. So at least some of the DNA that's being collected is accessible to the dye. So it might be on the surface of the nanoparticles. It might be in its own nanoparticle with like DNA and protein all kind of mixed together, uh, kind of like a spaghetti ball of, of DNA and protein. Um, and then some of them might be buried so deep inside the proteins or inside the particles that we would need to use a membrane permeable stain to be able to get inside. Uh, but at least uh, some of it is on the outside of the, of the particles. And I think that's also one of the you know, exciting things about the technology in general is that it's relatively gentle, if you will, to these you know, particles. Uh, and as, as Stu kind of described, the hydrogel interface, right? So these particles, and, and in those uh, SEM images that he shared, the idea is that these particles remain, for the most part, in their kind of native state and intact, right? Whereas a lot of other techniques tend to, you know, lice things open. And so it does offer that ability to do that surface analysis. And then if you want to do as a downstream step, lice these things open and, and further interrogate, you can do that as well. Yeah, and, and we demonstrated that uh, with a protein called TSG101, which is on the inside of exosomes. And so we would stain with our antibodies uh, on the collected particles on the chip, and we did not see TSG101 staining. We had to use, uh, we had to permeabilize the particles using um, uh, a particular compound that pokes little holes in the surface of the membrane, and then we could actually stain for TSG101. So that was another indication that the particles are collected in an intact state. Great, thank you. And for our last question, have you looked at vesicles from other cell types, such as immune cells and stromal cells, with respect to their charge and ability to capture? For example, I would expect that not all extracellular vesicles will have similar charges. Can you try to activate their charge to capture? Yeah, that's a really good question. The um, so. What's interesting, one of the big differences between dielectrophoresis and electrophoresis is that the charge of the particle doesn't really matter with DEP. So you can collect neutral, positive, or negatively charged particles. This dielectrophoresis technique is looking at taking advantage of the dielectric properties of the material. So basically, how fast do the, the charges inside the particle move uh, in response to a change in the external field relative to how fast the charges in the surrounding fluid move. So the actual overall charge of the particle itself doesn't really factor into that force. Um, but that being said, we think that we're collecting uh, particles also from healthy sources as well, uh, because they have the same dielectric properties, more or less. They're all made of 
lipids and proteins and, and those are quite similar to one another. Um, but these particles are being over secreted by the tumor. So uh, these collected particles are enriched for pieces of the tumor compared to other kinds of uh, uh, free floating proteases or, or free floating proteins that can have a lot of contamination from healthy sources as well. Great, thank you. That's all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank Stuart Ibsen and Rob Turner and our sponsor, Biological Dynamics. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we'll try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, an archive version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar. Thank you. Great.